Evening, Union Road family, go ahead and turn your Bibles to 1 Chronicles chapter 12. 1 Chronicles chapter 12. That will be our starting point and launching point tonight, 1 Chronicles 12. We're going to continue thinking about sharing our faith tonight. And when we think about sharing our faith, one of the things that comes to our mind so often is, well, that means we got to be door knocking. And, you know, that's a good thing to do, maybe. Just yesterday, we had some people knocking on our doors, and I got to listen in as they talked with Allison about whatever body of faith they were from. Maybe when we think about sharing our faith, that brings to mind maybe a Bible study at a coffee shop. You guys know I love coffee, and so that may give us an opportunity to gather around, study the Bible with our friend or a family member at a coffee shop. Maybe we hear the idea of sharing our faith, we think of a gospel meeting, that if we have a gospel meeting on why we believe in God, people will come and they'll hear the gospel preached. They'll understand why we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And those are good things to do. Those are things we need to be doing. But if we're going to reach the lost, we need to think about our day and our time. We need to understand the time because when we think, take a step back to understand the time, understanding our context is important for anything that we may do. I'm going to give a very embarrassing personal example. You see, back in 2012, I was coaching youth football. I loved it. It was fun. Coaching a bunch of fifth and sixth graders in youth football. And I got the bright idea of a first-year head football coach of a youth football team there in Bowling Green, Kentucky, that I was going to run plays I saw on Monday night football with fifth and sixth graders. It didn't go well because I forgot my context. I didn't understand the times. And so if we are going to effectively share the gospel today, we need to understand our times. And if we take a step back to understand our times, then I think, I believe we will not only be more effective, we will also be more convicted, and we will also look for ways to share our faith. I want us to walk away tonight with a better understanding of our day and our time and our context here in 21st century 2022 America. But if we're going to understand the times, we also need to learn from the past but we also need to live in the present for God. There in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, if you're there in your iPads, your iPhones, your Android electronic devices, or your old school paper Bibles, that'll be a good place. Because in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, the text reads, From the Issacharites who understood the time. So that sounds familiar. And knew what Israel should do, 200 chiefs with all their relatives under their command. These Issacharites understood the times. And this specific section of 1 Chronicles, the writer here is recounting all these mighty men, all these people that sided with David. All these people who allied themselves with David, who understood that David was the future king. And if we were to take a time to read that section of 1 Chronicles, we'd see it as an impressive list full of many men. Many families who realized that David was king and supported him as they could. But in that list, we see there in verse 32, the sons of Issachar. And there in the text, it tells us that they understood the times. They understood what Israel should do. Think about that for a second. That these men there when David lived 3,000 years ago looked around. They saw the changes in their culture. They saw the turbulence in their life, in their nation. And they realized what Israel needed to do. All because these men there in verse 32, these sons of Issachar, understood the time. So what we're going to do tonight is look at this phrase and use it kind of like a framework or maybe a launching point for our study today. Because if we are going to share the gospel today, if we are going to share our faith, we must understand the times. 
And then we think about our day and our time and we look around and realize there's a lot of changes going on in our culture too. Just like those sons of Issachar were dealing with changes in their day, we're dealing with changes in our day. It's been a turbulent last couple of years. COVID challenged us. Can I still say COVID? I'm going to say it. COVID challenged us. Politics has divided us, right? Economic uncertainty surrounds us, right? We live in turbulent times. And in turbulent times, the people of God need to understand the times. We need to take a moment and step back and look at our day and our time and think, how can we reach the lost today? But how many disciples of Christ don't understand the times? How many disciples of Christ have put our discipleship on autopilot? We're like ostriches that put their heads in the sand, not realizing all the changes that are going on around us, or maybe even rather ignoring all the changes that are going on around us. We don't know what it looks like to follow Jesus today. But we need to understand the times. And that attitude can be found in many congregations. Across the country, churches, bodies of Christ are doing things the way they've always been done because they've always been done that way without thinking about what's the best way to reach the lost? What's the best way to edify the saved? What's the best way to encourage our church family? Rather, they go, well, this is the way it's always been. This is the way it will always be without any thought of the reason why. But I want to be very clear as I say that, because I know somebody may be thinking, well, he's saying throw out the Bible. I want to be very clear. We do not change God's word. God's word never changed. We do not ignore God's authority. We do not ignore or change God's pattern. But we do need to take a moment to understand the times. We do need to take a moment to think about how can we best edify and evangelize and encourage and equip our body of Christ today. We need to ask ourselves, what's the purpose? What's the goal of our gospel meetings? We need to asking, why do we sing the songs that we sing? We need to ask ourselves, what's the best way to encourage our church family to raise their kids up in the Lord? We need to think about the best ways we can reach the lost right here in Lufkin, Texas. The sons of Issachar understood the times, do we? But as we think about understanding the times, I'd like to go to a guy in the New Testament there in Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13 is a great example of a guy who I believe understood the times. There in Acts chapter 13, Paul's there on his missionary journey, and he's traveling through. And in Acts chapter 13, he comes to Antioch of Pisidia. And when he gets to Antioch of Pisidia there in verse 14, he goes into the synagogue. And after the reading, verse 15, after reading the law and the prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them saying, Brothers, if, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, you can speak. Paul, in a room filled with Jews, speaks, stands up and speaks. And he, from that moment, preaches the gospel to the synagogue of Jews. He goes through the Old Testament story. He goes through Israel's story beginning there with the Exodus and all the way leading them to Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Christ. Paul understood the times. He understood what he needed to say to that specific audience to reach them. But just a couple chapters later in Acts chapter 17, Paul's traveling on another missionary journey and he comes to the city of Athens. And when he goes into the city of Athens, he gets called up in front of all these great philosophers, these men who are well-educated, surrounded with the, the best education you could have in the Greek world. And there, as he speaks to them and preaches the gospel to them, where does he begin? Open your Bibles to Genesis. I want to talk to you about this God. No, 
He starts there in verse 23. Hey guys, I was passing through and I came across this altar to an unknown God. I'd like to talk to you for a little bit about him. There when he speaks to the Greek philosophers there on Mars Hill that Pat preached on just about a month ago, he starts with an altar. He quotes a poet. We see there in Acts chapter 17 that Paul understood the times. When he was preaching to Greeks, he used Greek illustrations. When he's speaking to the uh, Jews, he used Jewish illustrations. He used the Old Testament. Paul understood the times. He took a moment to understand his context. So how do we become like Paul? How do we become like the sons of Issachar there in 1 Chronicles chapter 12? How can we understand the times that we are living in? Well, here are a few couple of suggestions. First, look around. The world is changing fast. 20 years ago, if you wanted to get an update on the news, the latest ball score, to find out that the Titans did beat the Broncos today, Luke, you would have to wait till Monday morning to find out. But not anymore. You can just pull it out your phone and check it on your ESPN app. Life has changed fast. 50 years ago, if we wanted to share the gospel with somebody, with our neighbor, with our friend, with our coworker, 50 years ago, we could reasonably assume that they probably were a Bible believer. They may not have attended the same church or family of faith that we did, but they probably read their Bibles. They probably believed in God, and so we could start with the Bible. But not anymore. We'll talk about that in a second. We need to talk to people. We need to talk to people we know well. We need to talk to people we just met. We need to listen to them. We need to listen to what interests them. Listen to what bothers them. Listen to their hopes and dreams, their struggles and their triumphs. If we want to reach the lost with the gospel, we need to understand the times. To help us understand the times that we are living in, I'd like to share a couple of statistics with you. A couple of statistics that I think are eye-opening. 33% of kids today are raised in families that don't believe in Jesus. Oh, let me rephrase this. Only 33% of parents of kids today are raising kids in homes where salvation believes is built on Jesus. Only 33% of kids, one in three kids today, are raised in homes where parents believe that Jesus is the only way to salvation. 25% of millennials, that would be kids roughly between the ages of 25 and 45. 25% of millennials are religious nuns. And what that means is they're either atheist, agnostic, or no religion in particular. 25% of millennials are nuns. And Generation Z, that's a generation that's roughly 10 to about 25 today. 33% of Generation Z are religious nuns. This is substantially higher than any previous generation. Substantially. The boomer generation that is represented here, it's like two to four times the boomer generation and two uh, two to four times the silent generation, which is the generation before the boomer generation. So why is all this stuff important? Why are these statistics important? Why am I sharing these numbers with you? Because I think it helps us understand the times. In previous generations, we could reasonably assume that my neighbor, my friend, my coworker did believe that Jesus was the only path to salvation. And they were raising their kids to believe that Jesus was the only path to salvation. In generations past, we could reasonably assume that my friend or my family member may not hold the same religious beliefs, but they still believed in God, they still believed in Jesus. But not anymore. So when we talk with our friends and our family members, our neighbors and our co-workers about spiritual things, 
we probably want to pause and ask some questions. Ask some questions about, do they believe in God? Do they believe Jesus is the only path to salvation? We need to stop and think about how we can reach the lost here in Lufkin, Texas. Because how we may want to reach the lost here in Lufkin, Texas may be completely different than what they do in New York City. It may be different than what they're doing two hours down the road in Houston, Texas. We need to think about what will work here in Lufkin, Texas. But at the same time, we may learn something from people in New York City. We may learn something from people in Houston, Texas, and what they're doing to reach the lost. So what we need to be looking at is the example of Paul there in Scripture that we just looked at in Acts 13 and Acts 17. You see, when Paul was trying to spread the gospel, when Paul was trying to reach the lost, Paul went to the synagogue. Paul went to the marketplace. He went to Mars Hill. Where's our marketplace? Where's our Mars Hill? Where's our synagogue? Where can we go to reach the lost with the gospel? This is really where the rubber meets the road for us. Because I believe it starts with our friends and our family members. It starts with people we know. Because relationships matter. Our most fertile ground for reaching the lost with the gospel are the people we know best. The people we have a relationship equity built up with. Those people that you would call that if you were stuck on the side of the road because your car ran out of gas or your catalytic converter got stolen and your car won't start. Those people, those are the people you start with. Because they care about you, they know you, and they know you care about them. But it goes beyond that. That we need to think about how we can use social media. We need to think how we can use the internet to tell others about Jesus. We need to think how we can use modern technology to speak truth of God's word. I know the internet is a minefield of crazy stuff these days. I know social media is dangerous, but we can use social media, we can use the internet, we can use modern technology to teach God's word. And we can use it very effectively. We need to understand the times. But our world may have changed, and it has. But the gospel, I believe, is always relevant. It is always relevant because it was written and inspired by an unchanging God. And so the gospel fits no matter the context. In a Jewish context, in a Gentile context, in a first century context, or a 21st century context. The gospel always fits. And so our job as disciples of Christ is to take that unchanging, timeless message, that the truth of God's word, and bring truth to life. We need to show people why they still need Jesus today. Because the gospel still works. And we need it badly today. But when disciples like you and me, when we as a church family, when church leaders don't stop, don't pause for a second to think about the times that we live in. Don't think about our context. Our attempts to reach the lost with the gospel may fall short. But my point here is not to bring us to despair. It's not that so that we can stay in these four walls of this church building and and sit on our hands and wait until judgment day comes. My hope is that this will challenge us to think how we can reach the lost with the gospel here in Lufkin, Texas, today. But if this is going to be an opportunity for us, if the day that is before us, this opportunity that we have to share the gospel tonight, today, tomorrow, this week, is going to be an opportunity for us, then we need to look at the world around us. We need to look at the example of Scripture 
And we need to see how can we share the gospel today. We need to get serious about evangelism. We need to understand the times. But even as we think about our times and seek to understand our times and live for, as the people of God here in the present, we also need to learn from the past. We need to see what God expected from his people there in the past so we can live as God's people today. Because our world may have changed, but the challenges that God's people faced in the past are not too different than the challenges we face today. And so for that, I'd like to look at Exodus 34. Exodus 34. We're going to look at three questions I see there in the text of Exodus 34 that I hope will spur our minds to think about our role and our purpose as the people of God. So as we read through Exodus 34 here in a second, remember what's going on here in Exodus 34. Let's not forget about the context. There in Exodus 34, Israel has been freed from slavery. They've crossed the Red Sea. They finally arrived at Mount Sinai. And when they're out at Mount Sinai and Moses has gone up the mountain to get those Ten Commandments, the people of Israel, the people of God get a little impatient. And they build this golden calf. Moses comes down and breaks the tablets of stone. So he has to go back up the mountain. It's here in Exodus 34 when Moses goes back up the mountain that God and Moses, for lack of a better term, have a little conversation. So let's look there at the text. As Moses reminds, or God reminds Moses of what he expects from his people. Look there in Exodus 34, beginning in verse 4, where Moses, it says, cut two stone tablets like the first ones. He got up early in the morning and taking the two stone tablets in his hand, he climbed Mount Sinai just as the Lord had commanded him. The Lord came down in a cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed his name, the Lord. The Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth maintaining faithful love through a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin. But he, that's God, will not leave the guilty unpunished, bringing the consequences of the father's iniquity on the children and the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. Moses immediately knelt low on the ground in worship. Then he said, My Lord, if I have indeed found favor with you, please go with us. Even though this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our iniquity and our sin and accept us as your own possession. So as we learn from the past, one of the first things that we need to remember is that God's people have a responsibility to God. And as Moses stands before the presence of God here in the text, he is overcome by the glory of God. And as God passes before him there in the text, he bows down, he worships God. He praises his name. But for so many of the people of God today, God is like Santa Claus. We go to God when we need stuff. We need a new job. We need a new car. We need more hours at work. We go to God because we want eternal life in heaven. But we never stop to worship him. Moses stops there on the mount and worship God. And look at Moses' humility one more time there in the text. As he sees God pass in front of him, he kneels low in worship. And as he talks to God there, he says, if I have found faith, Favor with you, my Lord. Please, please go with us. Even though I know Israel is stiff-necked, I know we're stubborn, I know we rebel, I know we sin. But will you please, Lord, go with us? Will you please forgive us? Will you please let us be your people? And as we think about Moses here in the text, we're forced to ask, one question, our first question, 
What is our attitude toward God? Do we praise God? Do we talk about God? Do we talk about our faith in God, the Bible, outside of these four walls? Or is our conversation about spiritual things limited to the four walls of this auditorium in our classrooms? We need to be talking about God in our workplaces. We need to be talking about God in our communities. We need to be talking about God in our ball teams and our bands. We need to be praising God every chance we get. Because we cannot expect the world to worship God. We can't expect the world to praise God if God's people don't worship God. So what's our attitude toward God? Let's go on there in the text because there in verse 10, the Lord responds and tells Moses, Look, I am making a covenant. In the presence of all your people, I will perform wonders that have never been done in the whole earth or in any nation. All the people you live among will see the Lord's work. For what I am doing with you is awe-inspiring. Observe what I command you today. I am going to drive out before you the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hethites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Be careful, God says, not to make a treaty with the inhabitants of the land that you are going to enter. Otherwise, otherwise, they will become a snare among you. Instead, you must tear down their altars, smash their sacred pillars, and chop down their Asherah poles. Because the Lord is jealous for his reputation. You are never to bow down to another God. He is a jealous God. Here as God describes what's going to happen in the coming days, in the coming years, in front of the eyes of Israel, he tells Moses, he tells Israel, don't let the surrounding nations, don't let their culture influence you. And God's point here in the text is simple. That evil companions corrupt good morals. God knows when they go into the land, they're going to be surrounded by pagan nation. God knows when they go into the land, their lifestyle, those cultures are going to be filled with sin. And uh, Israel is going to be influenced to follow those idols and follow that culture. They're going to be tempted to commit sexual immorality. They're going to be tempted to bow down to idols. They're going to be tempted to commit all these sinful acts. And God tells his people, don't go down that path. Because God realizes it would be very easy for God's people to become a godless people. God knows it would be very easy for Israel to be conformed to the culture around them rather than be transformed to be like their God. And so God's message to Israel there in verses 10 through 14 is simple. Don't be like the nations. Don't let their culture affect you. And that leads us to our second question. Are we helping or are we hurting God's reputation? God knows how Israel acts in the land is going to affect God's reputation. So he says, how you act, if you bow down and worship these gods, that's going to affect my reputation. He says, don't go down that path. Don't hurt my reputation. But he also says there, that third question that he puts before Israel is, don't let their cultures influence you. Don't bow down, verse 15 and 16. Don't make a treaty with their nation. Don't bow down to their gods. Don't eat their sacrifices. Don't let their culture influence you because their culture will pull you away from God. As we think about our life and our example here in the world around us, we're forced to ask those two questions about ourselves. Does my life, my conduct, my actions, does it help or does it hurt God's reputation? Does my life, my actions in the workplace or in the home, in the community, do they help or hurt my reputation? Does my life reflect one who's being conformed to the culture around us 
Or does it reflect one who is being transformed by God's work? Are we affecting culture or is culture affecting us? You see, if we've been saved by the blood of Christ, we are called to be different. We're called to be a changed people. We're called to be peculiar, some translation says. That means we need to dress different. We need to talk different. We need to act different. Our priorities need to be different. Because our conduct affects our ability to tell others about Jesus. Our actions help or hurt God's reputation. And so we need to make sure how we act and how we live don't, doesn't affect God's reputation, doesn't reflect one who's being conformed by the culture in which we live. Because if we live just like the world, the world won't notice anything different about us. But if we are different, the world will see and they will know that we are the people of God. So is the world affecting us or are we affecting the world? So why are these three questions important? These three questions are important, I think, because we are going to struggle to reach the lost if we are affected by our culture. We are going to struggle to reach the lost if we've hurt God's reputation. We are going to struggle to reach the lost if we don't worship God. So how in the world can we reach the lost today? How can I reach the lost in my life? Look what Paul says there in Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, Paul gives us this very simple instruction where he tells us, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed, Paul says, to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Paul tells us if we want to reach the lost in our culture, if we want to reach the lost today, then we as disciples of Christ, as the saved by God, need to give our lives as a living sacrifice. And that reminds me of what we went over today in our adult auditorium class there in 1 Peter chapter 2. That is, Paul, Peter there in 1 Peter chapter 2 is talking and thinking about the fact that we're honored and chosen by God. He explains why there in, I think it's verse 4, to offer spiritual sacrifices. And later there in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9, he tells us that the reason we are saved, the reason we are called a holy people and a people for God's own possession is so that we will proclaim His praises. And part of praising God is telling others about God. So every day when we go to work and we go to the gym, when we go out to our communities, we are surrounded by people of this world. And we need to be using every possible opportunity to live like Christ, to give our lives as a living sacrifice. And so the choice that is before us today is simple. Will I conform my life or I'll be transformed by the word? Every day we have to make a decision. Will I give my life as a living sacrifice or will I serve self? Will I take up my cross and follow close to Jesus? Or I'll use my life to point people to Christ? Or will I use my life to point people to self? As we look at our day and our time, we are surrounded by people who like to point people to self, who like to serve self, who want to elevate self, but the gospel isn't a message of self. It's a message of sacrifice. 
So if we're going to live as a people of God today, we need to be teaching people and showing people what it looks like to give your life as a living sacrifice. And that's the third point. We need to know how to live life in the present. And show people how to live life for Christ even today. If you're not living for Christ right here, right now, there's no better time than the present to make your life right with God. And we'd love to help you with that. If we can help you come to Jesus, make your life right with God, please let us know while we stand and sing. <laughs>